Welcome. My name is Brad Watson. I'm the Director of Academic Services at USU Eastern and Price, and welcome to Dr. Stewart's presentation of Learning Analytics, Turning Off the Drip, the Data-Rich Information Poor. We're glad you're here. It's my privilege to be able to introduce Dr. Courtney Stewart. Dr. Stewart is a former middle school, high school, science math teacher and principal. Whew. Rough ages. <laughs> He received his MED and PhD in Educational Leadership and Foundations from Brigham Young University. Prior to joining Utah State University's Instructional Leadership faculty, he held appointments as Associate Professor at University of Montana and Minnesota State University, Mankato. In addition to being an, a well-respected teacher, he was recently ranked as the third most influential person on campus. Congratulations. Dr. Stewart has previously directed principal academies and consulted for schools developing professional learning communities. He has published works within the areas of school reform, educational leadership, and rural education. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Dr. Courtney Stewart. So I, I put that um, in my bio because it's, I'm kind of embarrassed by it. It was almost laughable that I, was uh, influential. So I always tell people, they never said whether it was a positive influence or a negative influence. So maybe I have a negative influence. But um, thanks for coming. I, I'm glad I have a smaller group. This actually is less intimidating, and we can maybe be a, a little more uh, intimate. I can get some talking. Um, this is kind of familiar for my graduate classes. We have very small graduate classes. So hopefully uh, you can speak and feel like you can ask questions as we go throughout. But today I'm going to be talking about learning analytics, but I wanted to start uh, before. I just got back on Sunday from a trip that I took, and this was kind of a, a, a lifetime dream. Uh, I went to the land down under. I went to Australia. I was there for a conference, but I had the chance to tour around after. Um, the reason why it's a lifetime dream is I was actually born there when my dad was doing his doctorate in plant genetics, and I left when I was three weeks old and I've never returned. So it, I kind of had this insecurity of I didn't know where I was from, you know, where I was born. So I got to go home to see where I was born. So anyway, I went down to Australia, and I got to experience a lot of the cool culture and a lot of different things. Um, this was a sign that they had at one of their museums, uh, avoiding bush fires. Uh, they liked their liz lizards frilled, not grilled. I even made it to their Costco. And if you see this right here, has anyone been to Costco? couple of you? Well, if you go to Costco Food Court, uh, you're familiar with the other things, but very unique in Australia is this, the Aussie meat pie. They even sell that in the Costco. But the reason why I show this is because right here, I wanted to find something in Australia. Uh, and I'll take some guesses. What do you think I was looking for here in these woods? Koalas. koalas. Right, koalas. We don't have them in America. Uh, they're only found in Australia. And so here's a eucalyptus forest. Now, you'd think it'd be really easy to see them, right? Can't you see them? No, no, it's actually really hard. So I turned to, this is a beginner's guide to observing wildlife. Uh, it's actually from New South Wales. It was a little program they had. But they had some couple recommendations, and I wanted to point out here at the top. It says, many animals, especially mammals, are more readily identified by the traces they leave, such as tracks and scats, than by direct observation. So I was like, oh, I guess I'm not really going to see a koala. I'm going to get to see its scat. And that'll, that'll tell me I saw a koala. So I said, OK, well, we'll look for scats and tracks and scratch marks. So back to the forest. And sure enough, down at the bottom, um, we see this inter interesting uh, scat pellet. Bright green in color because what do koalas eat? Eucalyptus. They're the only animal, or one of the only animals, that can digest the eucalyptus that is toxic. They have this bacteria that allows them to digest and eat them, and it's one of their sole food sources. So sure enough, yep, there's been koalas. So, oh, and here's claw marks, and they've been highlighted with a red crayon. Um, but you can see the claw marks that there's been a koala that's climbed up and down that tree. So I know they're there in the trees. Uh, there's claw marks. Um, but I wanted to look for their tracks, their footprints. And it, it should have looked something like this. 
Um, and this is their forehand. And notice something unique. They have two thumbs. I thought that was kind of cool. Um, but that's what it should look like. But do koalas spend a lot of time on the ground? No. They're, they sp spend 80% of their life in a tree. And so there were no footprints for them to be found. But I was lucky enough, it was winter when I went, um, and I did get to see an actual koala. And so I was excited. We, it, we actually had to hike for probably about two miles up in these forests. And you'd see them occasionally, but they would be little puffballs way up high in the trees. But this one was low enough that we actually got to take a picture of it. So I got to see that animal. Even though I was set up for just looking at the traces that were more readily identifiable than actually observing the animal. Um, can you guess what this might be? That's a kangaroo, right? And that's, a, that's another story, but you can see the tail mark there, and that one's pretty uh, obvious, and then the footprints there, and then the hind footprint there, which is kind of interesting because they place their hand first and then their bottom butt. Um, so what does this have to do with student learning? We're going to be talking about learning analytics and student learning, uh, but what is observing wildlife? How is it similar? What do you think? Okay, the details. Yeah. So all these trace data, you know, every student, every animal acts differently, right? They have different habits, they have different trees they like, different food they like. We have different measures, uh, and like you're saying, you get different things that tell different stories about the different ways that students are approaching learning. Um, but the reason why I make this connection is oftentimes uh, we're not sure, 100% sure, whether our students are learning. So how do you know your students have learned? I assume most of you teach classes. How do you know that they have learned in your class? Susan? OK. Good. Ah, assessments. Oh, good. OK, so they actually tell you. You ask, you maybe a survey, you ask them. They told you that. I learned so much in this class. Thank you. Observations, you know, Susan, you were saying that you saw them maybe in a performance or their product. Um, you know, a skill, a job placement. In the session before, we were talking about um, nursing. And so you can see whether they learned when they're in the scenario. And so these are definite ways, and I'm not trying to discredit that these are a way of learning about students, but these are often outcome based, and these are tied to our standards and tied to our content that we're delivering. But there's another part of the student learning. What may be that other part? Well, and I want to talk more about this engagement. You know, are they engaged with the curriculum? Are they applying it? Are they internalizing it? What's their relationship? Are they making connections between your class and the class that they took before that they're going to take next? And so that's kind of the objective here that I want to talk about. And this is an interesting um, article I found <clears> that I'd like to read to you kind of gives that sentiment. On some deep level, the notion that college students should take tests to measure how much they've learned seems antithetical to what higher education is all about. College is about finding oneself and growing up, interacting with peers from across the nation and the globe, being challenged and captivated by new and fresh ideas about how electrons work, how societies organize themselves and come into conflict, how music soothes and disturbs, and so much more. Can any of this be measured? Even if it can, how do we know that what went on in the lecture hall, be it Harvard or Slippery Rock, was what helped that stu the student learn what he knows? And so this is kind of that larger overarching ideal that the students are being challenged, their epistemologies are changing, their, their frameworks are changing, um, they're evolving as, a, an in, as an individual. But I'd like to challenge that part of that is true, but we can still measure it, and we still can learn about that process that they're taking. So 
we can turn to other evidences that, as members from that wildlife, more readily identify the learning. Um, data, big data. And so I'm going to talk about some data sources and talk about some things that maybe inhibit the use of that data. Um, this data? No, not this data. That's a different data. This type of data? Uh, this is going through the number of emails sent every second, 2.9 million. Um, the tweets per day, 50 million tweets per day. Total minutes spent on Facebook each month, 700 billion minutes. That's a lot of data. Uh, that's a lot to process. That is big data. We're talking data. Kind of. I'm going to say this is kind of the data I'm going to talk about today. So let's talk about educational data. Um, these are large amounts of data, so this is still big data, but it comes from two different sources. It'll come from student descriptors, so that tends to be your student information systems, the demographics, their high school GPA, uh, gender, um, even ethnicity, you know, those types of things, the number of classes they're enrolled, the year in school. Those are descriptors about the student. That's one side. The other is their student behaviors. What are they doing? Um, the user's interactions, and with this, is, this is called an ICT, Information and Communication Technologies, and that is our canvas here at USU, uh, our learning management system. So how they interact with there? What are they doing in the courses? And then also their social media, and what are they doing while they're learning? What are they posting about or talking about or taking pictures of or tweeting? So there's a number of examples there, but that's our two main sources of big data in the educational realm for us. So these are traces. So similar to what I was looking for that koala, these are also traces that can help us inform about the way our students are learning in our classrooms. We still have our assessments. We still have our outcomes. But what about that information around? You know, we still want to see that koala, but there's ways that we can get to that koala and find out about it. So this data can help us answer questions as how. How did they learn? Where? When? What did they learn? Um, but that brings up the question of drip. And kind of back to the title of this presentation, oftentimes we have too much data. And we have so much data that we're very overwhelmed by the data, but we don't have any information from that. And that's the hope of learning analytics, is that it'll give us information using that big data that is meaningful. So it's that idea of turning off the data-rich, information-poor to be information-rich. So let's talk about what learning analytics is. And this is a definition that comes from an organization um, of the Society for Learning Analytics Research. It's called Learning Analytics is the measurement, collection, analysis, and reporting of data about learners and their context for the purpose of understanding and optimizing learning and the environments in which it occurs. And so I want to emphasize more that optimizing, because I'm sure our students are learning. Um, they're learning well. They're learning. They're getting jobs. They're graduating but optimizing that learning environment, increasing that engagement, helping them out. There's two assumptions with this type of learning analytics. One is that the data is uh, machine readable. You know, they come from a pre-existing source of data. That means that we can plug it into a computer and we can generate conclusions from it. Um, and then also that there's techniques that we can handle this amount of data, that we can generate conclusions or ideas. Um, it's practical, um, but not manually. We can't sit and compute it with our calculators and our pencils. It's too overwhelming for that. But there's some inhibitions to using this or getting to this point of learning analytics. And so here's a kind of a list that I have. But there's a number of things that maybe impede the use of learning analytics. And this is data in general and how we, over, we, we combat that big data source. So there's a lack of training. Um, and I'll just tell you with my process and when I'm going through this, I still don't know anything about coding. And, and in order to create data visualizations, which is a key part of learning analytics, you really need to know something about computer coding. And so that means I have to go to someone that does. And so we'll get to that later when we talk about some solutions. There's also this fear of exposure. We're afraid of being too revealing, or it's too revealing of us, of our practice. Um, we're afraid of what our peers may say or think. It might show something that may be negative. Um, there's also too much data. You're like, where do I start? Books and books or binders and binders and files and files of data. Uh, how do I jump into it? How do I begin? 
And then sometimes too little, which often isn't a problem, but it can be in a meaningful area that we don't have data, something I really want to know about, and there's no way to collect that data. Uh, there's abilities, uh, varying abilities of what I can do with that data or what that information tells me. Can I change um, whether I teach 10 classes, um, maybe? Uh, or maybe I can't change the demographic of my students. I can't change what type of students I get in my class. And then this idea of cultural versus procedural, there's a dissonance there sometimes of whether there was a cultural problem or just something in the procedure of the way the class is delivered. And then intentionality and lack of resources, those ones are pretty self-evident. But there are benefits to using learning analytics. And here's a few that I've come up with. Uh, one is evidence. We want proof, uh, especially for me that's pre-tenure and I need to make evidence that I'm, gonna, uh, that I'm an excellent teacher, I need proof that I'm an excellent teacher. Yeah, my evals are good, they, the students will say that, but this is information that can show evidence of my practice. Um, it also can remove doubt and, you know, oftentimes we're assuming that students are acting one way or engaging with my curriculum one way. Uh, we can give us evidence to that. Also, it helps us to be nimble. We can adjust our practice and in this day and age, often being nimble allows us uh, a greater success, a, a greater yield. Um, being nimble in our practice can help us quite a bit. And it can be grounded, uh, can be revealing, and one of the things I want to emphasize is that it's not just about us as teachers, it can help our students, and it can be more student-centered. It can give students context. How many of you use Netflix? Wow, over half, okay. So what does Netflix provide for you after you watch a few shows? Recommendations. Recommendations. Yes. And do you like the recommendations? Have you tried the recommendations? Sometimes. Right. Those recommendations are based on an algorithm as of your observing. So based on the category you watched, how long you watched it, what you watched. It makes a predictive suggestion for that viewer as to what they could watch or benefit from next. And so why can't we do that with our classes? The way they're performed in our class, could we not then offer suggestions to our students? Oh, maybe try this course. Or maybe try learning this way. Or maybe try engaging with Canvas this way. Um, that can be student-centered and can help students inform the way they learn uh, and give them insight into that. Uh, and the same thing with predictive. That's kind of predictive in nature. It can help us in planning and designing our curriculums for our, our departments or our courses. Um, it can help us help students that may be struggling with our beginning level undergraduate classes to get to completion. And then it can also help us change our practice. So a lot of potential benefits. So I wanted to show a couple of examples. And the first is, these are mainly visualizations. And that's the next step. So we take that big data and we're going to generate some large visualizations that give us information. And so I wanted to share a couple. And these are, hopefully this website will be, or my PowerPoint will be available and you can look at these in more detail. But I wanted to pull up this first one. This is from the New York Times. And the New York Times uh, took a study where they looked at uh, districts across the United States. And they wanted to compare, and this is looking at the achievement gap, and they're looking at money. So the richer and the poorer the district, how well they're performing above or below <laughs> grade level. And so the nice thing about data visualizations and learning, in lack, inner, learning analytics is that it becomes very interactive. You'll see that most learning analytic visualizations are web-based because they're interactive. So here is the educational attainment of each school district in the United States. And we can actually go and look up uh, where we live here. And it'll point us where we are on that uh, continuum. But you can see here um, that, and this is a range here at the bottom, you can see richer to poorer, that this information is showing us that there, there tends to be the more wealthier the district, the greater the performance on there. Okay, yeah, but does that really help us in our achievement gap? So they keep going and they break down and they look at the different demographics of white, um, Hispanic, and black students. And this one you can actually click on and then you can compare and show where the white students performed and where the black and Latino students performed for each of those districts. And so you can see there's some discrepancies. This is a school in D.C. or the District of Columbia. Huge disparity. Very evident, it shows in that data, it's very visual, it shows us that. Well, what about when they're also in poor areas or they have the same throughout? 
Um, so then they go through and they look at the parent's income. And even though the income may be similar, the performance is still different. So that's one potential uh, visualization of data. And this TED Talk, I would encourage you if you have a chance, this is um, David McCandless. He talks about visualizations and the, the beauty of data visualizations. And this is actually his website. And so I won't click on the PowerPoint or on the TED Talk, but I wanted to show you he has a number of visualizations where he goes through and looks at data and just shows some conclusions from it. So like these first top two, you can see this when he goes through a number of stories or movies that are based on a true story and goes through frame by frame about whether that was actual or false. And it occurs and he can show you overall how true it was. But the one I wanted to show is down here. This is, um, and we were talking about social media. And so this is media uh, tweets, posts, e and he did a scraper that took all this information out of the uh, journal or out of newspapers and about fears that people have in the media. And so you can see there's a number of different fears here. Um, so, and they happen at different times. And so he went through and he plotted these based on time frames. And he talks about how they keep emerging. If you notice the, the, the blue is killer wasps, they keep coming up once a year. And it's always in the middle of the year, during the summertime. Uh, the other one is Ebola. You can see the, the, the tall black one there. And that one was so large and so fearful that if you click on this, it shows it in an actual comparison of how, how much fear was with Ebola as compared to everything else. And so he titles this Making Mountains Out of Molehills. Um, but this is a way to show that how people are reacting to things in the media, how the fear is being spread through different things that are showing up in the media. Really information visualization, so. Um, another one that I wanted to share, this is a potential uh, source, is called uh, Parallel Sets. It's a way of comparing categorical data. And um, Jason Davies also is a data visualization, or visualization guy. He goes through, and, and this is the Titanic. And he broke down the Titanic survivors. And the benefit of these visualizations is they're also interactive. So we can drag and drop and we can move things. Um, so we can take the child and we can move it over here and we can look. But as we click on areas, we, it highlights. And so what do you see overall on this one? What does this tell us about the survivors of Titanic? Just as a quick look, and you guys have only seen it for 30 seconds now. More females survive, overwhelmingly. What about the crew? The crew's down here. Yeah. Most of the crew died. Yep, first class passengers survived. Second class also survived. What about children? Actually, 50% of the children survived. Um, but it's, infer it, it's interesting how we can generate or we can discover a lot of these things just by simply looking at this visualization within a minute's time. But if I were to give you the Excel spreadsheet of this, it would take hours to comb through that and look. So that's a potential benefit. So let's go back to me. And so the reason why I'm involved and why I'm talking about learning analytics is um, I was intentional in collecting data to inform my classroom. And so I tried some new things in my class. And one of the things I tried was I built in a learning path into my uh, online class of master's level students. And I gave the students options to learn. They could pick to receive the content visually, uh, auditorially, uh, or they could read, write it, or they can do a kinesthetic example. And I wanted evidence to show that that was beneficial. So I'm going to skip down and I'm going to show you. These are a couple visualizations from my class. So if you look over here, this is the spreadsheet that I got from uh, the city folks. They gave it to me just so I could see. Is that meaningful at all? No, I saw that and I'm like, what do I do with this? But this is a common delimited file and they actually use this when they're coding and they can build it into programs. Um, but then I had some help and I created some visualizations that really helped inform my class. So if you remember, I, I told you we had four different learning paths. And this is one semester. This was a spring term in 2015. I had, I think it was 12 or 15 students. And this shows me by coloring uh, how my students progressed throughout the semester and whether they stayed with the same type of learning modality or they switched. And so what do you guys think overall? Very quickly, you've seen it now for about 25 seconds. 
yeah, a lot of them stayed. But is there an overwhelmingly one preferred modality? And that's, and I can actually go up and I can isolate if I want to just show. Uh, and so that allows me to look very quickly at how many people would chose kinesthetic and stayed with kinesthetic. Well, quite a few, more than half. And so I can reset this and then I can look, oh, well, let's check oral. Actually, there's probably an easier way. Yep, there. So not many people picked auditory or I had podcasts that they would listen to. And so that's informing for me as a teacher. So that was one, vis <coughs> sorry, one visualization that I used. Another one was how they progressed through the course. I wanted to know what happened on day one when they went through this uh, learning, uh, the learning modules. And so this isn't very telling here, but what it is telling are these pie charts of where they first viewed when they came into the course. I spent a lot of time building the home page. Everything was tied to the home page. That's where they started. It was the beginning. It had all the information, it had examples, it linked to a lot of parts. So I s spent a lot of time on the home page. Well, thank goodness most of the students here, the very first content was the home page. And as I hover over it, 84% looked at the home page first. Yes, that's uh, reaffirming for me as I spent so much time on that. But I still had three students that didn't, that went to grades first or to the introduction forum. And then I can view their second, third, and fourth content later on throughout. Um, and so that was informing for me as well. And then this last one, I'll just show you quickly. Uh, this was their first clicks. So this is their timeline as they entered. And so you know that student that emails you before the first assignment's due and says, I need some more time. Um, this shows me when they began to engage with the curriculum. So I, I know from day one whether they clicked, what they viewed, what they saw, and then actually, it gives a little credibility, and I know Abby talked about that trust, and I want to give them that trust, but the data doesn't lie sometimes. And so I can use that to verify that trust that I have. This, this is after the fact, so this one was a little after, but the learning analytics option or the student analytics option in Canvas, I can see that, their page views. And it shows me the day, and actually, if you look on the number, or if you look on the people, it shows me the last time they logged in, and it shows how much time they've spent in the course. So I've actually used that when they've emailed me and said, oh, I'm way behind, I can't, and I'm like, oh, I've seen you've only looked at three of the 20 pages you're supposed to. You've submitted all your assignments late, and so that's telling for me as an instructor. So that is part of the problem, you know, and, you, and that's a great point that you bring that up, is a lot of this is after the fact, you know. It's very summative in nature, but hopefully it'll inform the next time I design or deliver the course. Um, and then this last one I wanted to show, and this, is, um, and this isn't happening only in my course. This is happening in, in multiple courses throughout the university. Um, but I just wanted to show you this. This is another graph from my class right there. That one is very hard to interpret, but... Um, but these are a number of courses that we can look at, um, and this, this is, may not be as meaningful, but I can go through and I can look at other courses um, that are being, and then compare it. So this is a freshman course that's being offered, and so this has, my students only, I only had 15, this has over 800 students. And so this is telling um, also for the instructor of whether the students are first visiting the home page, 50% of the students. And so then I can compare how it is um, to my course. Which one? Oh, you want me to pull it up? <laughs> so about 54% went to the home page. Yeah. And so I can compare across uh, classes, across colleges, across things that way. Um, but there's other things that you can look at. Um, you know, the university is looking at enrollment trends, even Canvas adoption, um, page sequences, and so on. And then this is an option in the student metrics that, you know, most of you have. Oh, it's not clicking. That's funny. Let's go here. Refresh. And then, oh, 
wow, it's not working. But that's the student metrics. That's the one that each instructor has throughout their course of how their students are performing their grades, um, how often they turned in assignments. So that was the potential. Five minutes? OK. So just to kind of wrap up, whoops. Uh, some solutions and some recommendations is have a learning path. Uh, as with anything that we're trying to incorporate into our courses, it takes time. And it's not something that you can adopt tomorrow. Um, so you've got to have a plan of what you want to learn about. Learn what learning analytics is, the potential. Is it meaningful? Is it meaningful for you and your practice? Um, how and what type of data would you like to collect? What would you like to see? What would be most meaningful? And the nice thing is, is get help. There's no way I could do this alone. Um, John Louvier in City, he works in AIS, academic, is it instructional services. Um, he has a, a support staff that actually will program, or they'll write the code and they'll conduct and create all these visualizations for me. And then they'll help me as I go through and want to collect this data. So don't feel like you have to do this on your own. Um, and those experts are here on campus. Today, uh, right now, at the same time, Civitas is here. They have a new data warehouse management. It's going to become the new data mart. And you're going to be able to go through and access that and pick what type of data you would like uh, from multiple, port, multiple sources to help inform your practice or even your program. Um, and then just some other recommendations or solutions is data visualizations. There's so much out there. And education is probably five years behind uh, many other fields in using big data and data visualization. And so look to those other fields. Uh, that McCandless, that TED Talk, he's a journal. He's a journalist. And that's all he does is he processes data. And he has amazing visualizations that are informing. Um, so look to other fields and see what's available. And then start playing with software. There's new software out there that's free, that's actually very user friendly, uh, that doesn't take coding to require, you know, coding to, to create these visualizations. Um, and how can you use it? There's even apps that you can uh, have on your phone to look at visualizations or different information sources. So. Um, but other than that, I, that's pretty much my experience with learning analytics, and I hope that you can see your koala this next semester in your classes. So, thank you. Does anyone have any questions, comments, thoughts? So that one I showed you, Parallel Sets, that one is free. And he allows anyone to download it. And the nice part about that one is it's only an Excel spreadsheet. It's categorical data. So it, but he does have some suggestions on there of how you can use quantitative data. But it's really cool because it allows you to disaggregate and separate things um, and look at them in a very basic visualization. That's one. Tableau is another one. Uh, Tableau is free, and you can get an a academic license for free. That one's a little more coding, um, but Megan Lewis uh, here on campus, I think it's Megan Lewis. I have to check that last name, but it is Megan. It is Megan Lewis. Okay, Megan, uh, she can help you. She is the one that's created all of these visualizations. And oftentimes, if you have the code, you, and she can give you that code, you just have a data source and put it in. It'll create that visualization for you. But those are two that come to the top of my head right now. But there are multiple softwares out there. Even Excel is changing. Um, I know Excel Office or Excel, is it Excel Home, or there's one that you can do online now that has a, a lot more visualizations built into it uh, than it used to have. Other questions, comments, suggestions? I won't claim to be the expert in this area. Okay, thank you.